addiction is seen in the legal world as some kind of a choice somebody makes. Well, believe me, I work with hardcore addicted people. Nobody ever chose to be an addict. I've had my own addictive issues. I've never chose to be. I didn't choose it. Hi, Mary Ann Williamson here, and welcome to this week's podcast. You know, I began lecturing on A Course in Miracles back in 1983, and uh, the world in many ways was quite different then, but uh, many things were very much the same. And one of the things that became a very big issue in the middle of the 1980s was the AIDS crisis. And because I was giving lectures about miracles and spirituality, I had a lot of experience very up close and personal with people who were suffering through that crisis. But there was another uh, issue that I came up close and personal with during that time because of all the people who came to the Course in Miracles lectures and who were reading the Course in Miracles um, who were involved with it. And that was people with uh, 12-step program issues. Also in my own life, dating someone who was an addict for quite a while, uh, even though at the time I thought because of his involvement with AA, uh, with NA actually, I didn't realize he was still using. But uh, in my own life, two years, uh, living with a, an active heroin addict, although like I said at the time, I didn't realize he was active, uh, definitely puts you uh, in a situation where you have a lot of um, understanding, where you have a lot of experience of some of the trauma that is involved there, uh, not only for the addict, but also for the people who, is ar who are around him or her. So I had a lot of exposure uh, to 12-step programs, uh, certainly went to my own uh, went to my own share of Al-Anon meetings, which were very, very helpful to me. And I came to have a deeper understanding that addiction applies to a lot of things, not just uh, substance abuse. You might not be an alcoholic, you might not be a drug addict, but when you have a deeper understanding of what addiction is all about, then you do come to understand that any activity uh, which brings you pleasure, but at some point uh, carries a craving with it, carries negative consequences, with it. If you don't have it, when you don't have it right, when you want it, you begin to realize that you might have some addictive tendencies that you might not have associated with an actual addiction. And that conversation has permeated the culture now. People realize this. Uh, if you've read the, if you've seen the film, um, uh, social dilemma everybody gets. Who among us doesn't have some aspect of addiction to uh, social media these days, to your phone, to all of those things? I remember when my daughter was a little girl, and I would say to myself, I had to have my phone with me just in case she needed me. And then I remembered when she was an adult, and uh, <laughs> it really wasn't such an issue that uh, she might need me at any given moment. I noticed that that thing was in my hand, not just because of my daughter, but because of something else deep inside myself. So the conversation around addiction now has grown to the point where people realize that it's a continuum and it's a journey that many of us are on because the society itself uh, is redolent with so many factors, with so many aspects. Uh, workaholism, uh, the way that we work, the very way that we are in this culture so often carries with it behavioral patterns that you could look at from a, uh, from a distance and go, somebody's addicted to this or somebody is addicted to that. Well, uh, back in 2008, a book came out that everybody was reading, everybody that I know. It was very much a book that was became part of the cultural conversation among anybody deep into spirituality, issues of spirituality and addiction. And that's a book called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts by Gaber Mate. And uh, I had never met Gaber Mate, and I I haven't met him. I'm very much looking forward to the interview that we're going to have here in a few minutes. But his thinking has been absolutely seminal. And the thinking of the book, uh, In the Realm of the Hungry Ghosts, and also a book he wrote called When the Body Says No, takes the conversation around addiction to an even deeper level of root cause, and that has to do with trauma. You know, I've been around long enough that I've seen certain words become trendy at certain times, and certainly the word trauma is out there a lot. It wasn't like we weren't discussing people's traumas before, but now there's more of a cultural mainstream understanding of how traumatized we are as a society and how much personal trauma underlies not just addiction, but so much of the, of, of the suffering that people go through. 
When I ran for president, one of the main pillars of my campaign and one of the main reasons uh, that I ran for president was because of my awareness that we have tens of millions of American children who live with chronic trauma. We have uh, millions of American children who clinical psychologists would refer to as victims of PTSD that is at least as severe as the PTSD of returning veterans from Afghanistan uh, and Iraq. And if somebody is a veteran who's come home from a war zone, it's post-traumatic stress. But many of these kids are living with present traumatic stress because of situations in their homes, situations in their streets. I don't know if Americans realize how many millions of American children are growing up in what are referred to as America's domestic war zones. And even before the pandemic, we had uh, 40% of Americans who were unable to absorb a $400 unexpected expenditure. And now it's deemed, given COVID, that a majority of Americans are living with financial insecurity. Poverty is a trauma, and a child growing up in a, in a poverty-stricken home are, is definitely more vulnerable to trauma and, uh, and more probable, uh, it is more probable that that child, that child is experiencing some level of trauma. So many of the societal dysfunctions that we have in our country today arise from deep, deep levels of trauma. One of the things that Gabramate talks about that I think are so important is how much of this begins during childhood, how much of this begins with, with neurons in the brain that literally become different when somebody is exposed to childhood trauma. So now we have terms like mental health crisis, but we need to go a lot deeper than just talking about it as this mass epidemic of a mental health crisis. We have to have a deeper conversation in our society about where this mental health crisis emerges from. Not only what are the external societal factors, but what are the deeper personal factors involved and how we relate to each other. Where does spirituality come in? What is the role of, 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 of the larger economic and political system in addressing these various factors of trauma that are causing so much damage in people's lives. Things like um, trauma-informed education, things like community wraparound services. This is why when I was running for president, I wanted a department of children and youth. Our political system is completely uh, systemically neglectful of the needs of America's children. Uh, children aren't old enough to vote, so they're not a constituency. They're not old enough to work, so they don't have any financial leverage. Therefore, the political establishment has only the most superficial conversation about the trauma of America's children. It talks about child uh, child cr tax credits, all those kinds of things, which are all very good. It, they talk about things like um, uh, emergency nutritional services, all of which are very good. They're very much in the air right now, having to do with America's COVID relief plan. But none of that goes deeper. When I, when I was running for president, I would talk to so many people who were uh, child psychologists, who were experts in early childhood, who were educators, who were dealing with the unbelievable trauma of so much of America's children. And uh, social workers, people who were dealing with state agencies, and I would hear the most amazing stories, uh, horrifying stories about the pain of so many of our children, but also very hopeful stories about the work that these professionals had done to make a child's life better. But all around this country, I would ask, I would say so often, of the kids in this district and the children of your in your community who need the kind of services that you provide, about how many are you able to reach? And over and over again, all over the country, I would get the same answer. And that would be this, about 10%. About 10%. So this is a huge sea of human suffering, a huge sea of human trauma that goes unaddressed in our world today, and certainly in our own country. And so much of it is within the lives of our children. We will pay a terrible price for this. This is something that has been uh, 
emergent from huge amounts of, of, of despair that had been that had been building up in the United States in large part due to economic pressures over the last 40 years. And now with the COVID uh, pandemic and everything that has happened in people's lives over the last year, I shudder to think what's happening. I shudder to think what's happening in the minds and in the hearts, in the lives and even the bodies of so many of America's children. And I fear that we'll be paying for this for many years to come. It's an area where America better wake up. I've seen it over and over again. I've seen it in 12-step meetings uh, when I would be going to so many Al-Anon meetings. I've read about it enough in books about things that relate to my own life where there are behavioral patterns that we have to look at in terms of trauma, in terms of addictive tendencies. I've seen it so much in working with people who are uh, dealing with life-threatening illnesses, AIDS, cancer, and others. I've seen it so much in people dealing with deep poverty. I've seen it so much dealing with people who are incarcerated and who we're not born. We're not born as children to end up on a trajectory to where they have found themselves. People like Gabor Mate are putting the mirror, mirror up to Western society. It's almost like we're being forced to look at some things and to talk about some things that we need to look at and we need to talk about. There's an extraordinary documentary based on Mate's work called The Wisdom of Trauma. I really look forward to asking him about it because this, this documentary is fantastic. Uh, walk, don't run to see it. The wisdom of trauma. We need wise people to explain this, this stuff to us. We need some real leaders to tell us how to handle this gargantuan, gargantuan amount of pain in our midst. We can't avoid this any longer. We must do this. Just as when you know a person who is an addict and it gets so bad that you that you're thinking, if this doesn't stop, they, they might die. And, and enough of us have known people who have died of alcoholism. Enough of us have known people who died of drug overdoses. That's now it's part of our mainstream cultural conversation. We've all either received the phone call or made the phone call. It's very common now where somebody says to somebody, did you see how she acted at that party? Somebody says, yeah. And you say, do you think we ought to do something? Everybody knows what that means today. It means you think we ought to have an intervention. You know what? One of the reasons I ran for president, and I said it while I was running, is because America needs an intervention. We are moving in a direction that is maladaptive for the survival of our democracy and possibly even for the survival of our species. And we're not going to be able to turn this around unless we do what any individual addict does. Take a good look at your pain, at your addiction, and at your trauma. No one knows more about it than Gaber Mate. Here he is. Gabor Mate, thank you so much for being on my podcast. It's a real honor to have you here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. What you have contributed with your books, with the recent documentary, with all of your workshops and talks, to the whole conversation, not only around addiction, but around the trauma that lies underneath it, is something not only of great interest to people in fields of recovery, psychotherapy, etc., but now I think to the entire culture, because the entire culture now is traumatized. Um, one of the things that makes your own work particularly compelling is that you speak from your own experience. So much of what you talk about has to do with the traumas that we carry over from childhood. So I know that you have told this story many times, but for people who are listening who have not heard it, I think it gives such a foundation to your work. Can you tell us um, something about your own traumatic experiences, your relationship to the Holocaust, et cetera, so that people can have a deeper understanding of where you're coming from? Well, thank you for asking. I will. But I have to begin by telling you that something that you said recently or is, that was quoted by you, that the suffering is not because of the pain we experience, but because of a refusal to accept the pain. And I, I just really got that very clearly, very recently. So all my life, I've been carrying on the pain and the resistance to the pain of what happened to me in infancy and what happened to my family, which is that being Jews in Hungary under the Nazi occupation, my family was devastated by the genocide. My grandparents were killed in Auschwitz. My mother and I spent uh, my first year of my life a little bit more under Nazi occupation, under conditions of privation and terror and... Um, 
and uh, daily dire difficulties. Uh, I was sick. I was hungry multiple times. I was separated from my mother as a one-year-old. And all that left a deep imprint in my brain and in my mind and in my body. And uh, it really hurts, you know? All that stuff really hurts. But what creates the trauma is not that something hurts, but that we don't know how to be with that pain. And of course, as a one-year-old, how would I know to be with that pain? So we build all these defenses against it. We close our hearts. We try and do too much to fix things. Um, we take on too much responsibility or we deny responsibility altogether. But we, we try and protect ourselves from the hurt of it. And so it's almost like a scar that forms around the wound. <clears throat> the wound is very sensitive and it's very painful if anybody touches it. But the scar tissue is also very hard and it's not very flexible. It's very rigid. So it's almost like trauma is a combination of a sensitive wound that if you, somebody touches it, it just triggers you and you hurt like crazy. Or if they touch scar tissue, there's no feeling there. There's hardness. There's no flexibility. So trauma is a combination of extreme sensitivity and hardness. And that's what I experienced in my life. And I've had to do a lot of work to, to come back to myself. One of the things that you talk about in your books and in your talks is that the neurons of the brain are literally changed when a child is traumatized. Uh, one of the things yeah. that you've said that is so impactful is when you were an infant and your mother called the doctor, and of course the Nazis had not arrived in Hungary yet, but they were on their way. And your mother called the pediatrician to say that you were crying all the time, and the pediatrician said, all the Jewish babies are crying. Yeah, so this actually happened two day, the, the day after the Germans came okay. to Hungary, the very next day. So I was two months of age. And, 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 and you know, of course, and my point was that I didn't know anything about Nazis. What was I picking up on? I was picking up on the stress and terror of my mother. Two things are being brought up here, then, not only the trauma of the child, but that small children are picking up on the trauma of their parents. My proposal for a United States Department of Children and Youth. And of course, what I talk yes. about in there is something that you really gave to the world, the whole idea of trauma-informed education, community wraparound services, all of those issues that we need to deal with in our children that go way beyond what we think of as an ed educational curricula that they need. And you talk about emotional education. And, and it's not that I gave it to the world, it's something that I certainly endorse. Um, but the point I want to make is it doesn't take severe circumstances like my family endured. It just takes parents that are economically disadvantaged or stressed or who haven't worked out their own trauma or who don't have enough time to spend with their kids or who have their relationship issues. And the children already in the uterus are picking up on that stress and that is affecting their brain development. That affects the neurons in their brain. It affects the chemical messengers and the receptors for those chemical messengers in their brain. And so that when we look at what's happening with children today and you get all these millions of kids being diagnosed with ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder and bipolar disorder and conduct disorders and reactive attachment disorder and depression and anxiety, one could, and learning difficulties, one could go on and on and on. And we think that these kids have some kind of a biological problem. Well, they do, but the biology is a result of the stresses under which they were developing from the womb onwards. So we have this epidemic of children's so-called mental health issues, and what's really going on is an epidemic of stress that's affecting the parents. And I'm not talking about whether parents love their kids or not. I'm talking about the stresses that unwittingly they pass on to their children. 
a lot of the stress today, and this was true even before the pandemic, but definitely with the pandemic, a lot of that stress, of course, is economic. And when I hear a political system uh, acknowledge that we have a huge uh, mental cr- mental health crisis, when politicians have asked me what I think uh, that they should do about the mental health crisis, my response is stop driving everybody crazy. Uh, because when you were completely, when you were always passing policies that make it more and more probable that people are dealing with chronic trauma day after day after day, poverty is a trauma. Poverty itself is a trauma. And so often, of course, this is passed on to the weakest person in the family system who happens to be the child. Where- yes, and, and of course, yeah, and, and, and poverty is a trauma. But, you know, when you look at the literature these days, even the average so-called middle-class person is under tremendous stress. I mean, people are losing ground. They were having to work extra hard to just to keep up. I'm talking before COVID. So in a lot of so-called middle-class families, um, parents are having to work really hard to maintain a standard of living, and children are deprived of the presence of their parents for most of the day. But that's stressful for small children. Well, be in the 1970s, a one one parent in the household working full time was enough for the average American family to be able to make enough to live on. So you don't yes. have that constant pres- presence of one parent who is there mainly uh, mainly for the nurturing and the nourishment of the child. And then also, and you talk about this in, in this excellent documentary, The Wisdom of Trauma, about how there's a lot of trendy thinking today that actually makes young mothers feel that they should not pick up their child when the most natural thing in the world is to pick up their child. There's all this talk about self-comfort. I know my mother told me when I had a child, she said, you cannot spoil a child before the age of two. And I think that was some of the best advice I ever got. I was in a car once, it was several years ago, and I had been visiting someone in the Hamptons in New York. And I needed to go back into New York City, and there was a couple that I didn't know, and their infant, and they offered me a, a ride back to Manhattan. And I was in the back seat, there was a car seat with the baby, and the parents were in the front seat, the father was driving, the mother was in the passenger seat. This child was just crying hysterically, and the mother refused to do anything. And she goes on this long spiel about how the child has to learn to self-comfort. And the father even, it's interesting because he wasn't comfortable with it. And he was like looking at her and deferring to her while she's the mother. I was getting so upset. I wanted to scream out, I'll pick up your baby. Pull the sign, let me pick up your baby. But I've met so many young mothers who have been led to believe that there's something unnatural about within in these years of infancy, wanting to do the bonding that people for thousands and thousands and thousands of years have done with their young. Have you seen that as well? Well, not for thousands, millions of years, actually. I mean, all mammals do that. Try and tell a mother cat not to comfort the kitten when she's upset. Try and tell a mother gorilla to let the baby go when the baby's uh, distressed. And, and Aboriginal peoples carry their babies everywhere they go. Now, going back to um, Dr. Spock, you know, who in many ways was a very fine man, but in the 40s, he was writing to young mothers that they should not give in to the tyranny of the infant who wants to be picked up, the tyranny of the infant. And the infant just needs to be held. It's a natural, human, bio- biological, emotional need. And, and generations of mothers, this has been trained out of them. Basically, we've lost touch with our gut feelings and, our, and with our hearts. You know, and, and, and people are giving this advice all the time. And then when a two-year-old misbehaves, so-called misbehaves. Now, a two-year-old cannot misbehave, by the way, let me tell you. A, a two-year-old behaves, but it's not misbehavior. She's just acting out something. Parents are told, separate from the child. Time out. Well, the, the child's biggest need is connection with the parent. So basically, parents are told to go against the child's needs in order to discipline them. And then we wonder why so many kids end up with difficulties. We live in a culture that, you know, not, you, you must know the my friend, the uh, singer Rafi. You must know him. Yeah, I do. Uh, well, Rafi has this concept of the child honoring society. And the child honoring concept that he's got 
looks like very much like your idea of a department of children's and you affairs or whatever you know and then in what, what what world would we live in if we actually realized what the developmental needs of the child really are and we know what they are but we live in a very different world these developmental needs we now know and i think even in the last 10 years there's been such so much more information that's been disseminated about the brain development and the personality development of a child in those first five years so what we yeah. have is a situation where all of these children are 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 living with with needs unmet and then by the time they arrive in kindergarten they're already traumatized sometimes these kids are traumatized even before preschool so what are what are the elements of this child honoring society particularly in terms of our educational system that should be introduced in such a way that possibly some level of repair could be accomplished well if i can even I'll get, I'll get to that, but let me take a step back from that, is that um, given that we know that the emotional states of the mother has a physiological impact on the brain development of the child, I mean, I'm not going to go into the details here, but I'm just telling you what the undisputed scientific reality is. That means that the support for healthy child development needs to begin at the first prenatal visit. And we have to make sure that, that mothers who are carrying babies get whatever support they need to deal with their stresses, not to be in, uh, under financial pressure, to get emotional support. The prenatal visits should not just be for blood pressure and blood tests and measuring the size of the increase in the uterus, but also attending to the mother's emotional needs. Then we have to make sure that our birth practices don't traumatize mother and child, which very often these days they do. So modern gynecology, obstetri obstetrics, has made undisputable contributions to saving lives and, and preventing dire events from occurring, but it's gone way too far. And now it's become very interventionist and very non-heart-centered, and we're actually interfering with the mothers and the child's natural release of chemicals that promote bonding between mother and infant. This is, again, pure science. So we need to look at how we have managed birth. Then we need to look at, particularly in your country, which is, even from the Canadian perspective, we were far, prefer, we're far from perfect, but it's barbaric what happens with maternal leave in your country. A quarter of American women have to go back to work within two weeks of their child's birth. Now, nature wants that child to be with that mother for a year or more. That's, I'm talking about natural development now. Separation from the mother, anytime before then, is a trauma for the child, period. And a trauma the for the mother. Brain is, and a trauma for the mother, and a trauma for the mother. Now, I'm not talking about keeping women barefoot pregnant in the kitchen. I'm talking about the development needs of the child now. So, so women need to be given, and families need to be given, or, or the father should stay home. And when I say mothering, it doesn't even have to be a female mother, you know. But from the point of view of breastfeeding, which, of course, only women are equipped to do, that should go on. You know, in Aboriginal societies, you know what the average age of weaning is? What is Four it? years. Wow. Four years. And goes on between two and five years. The average is four years. This is the natural way to do things. Now, I'm not saying we should try and import Aboriginal ways of being, but we should understand the wisdom of, of the natural wisdom of human beings that we've lost. So, so in terms of child development, they need to be in a warm, nurturing context for much longer than they are these days. Now, the schools. So there's an article from Harvard University that appeared in the journal of Pediatrics in February 2012, and they talk about the necessary conditions for brain development. And uh, what they say is that the, the brain develops from the womb until adulthood. So from womb to adulthood is a period of brain development. And the most important influence 
on brain development is the mutual responsiveness of adult-child relationships, particularly in the early years. That's the most important factor in promoting the physiological development of the brain, the mutual responsiveness. So in any, any society where parents are not able to respond to the children the way the children need to be responded to because of stresses on the parents, the way we've talked about, is interfering with the brain development of the child. As far as the schools are concerned, us, our educational system is convinced that their task is to teach facts and skills. No, it's not. Their primary task is to promote healthy brain development. And, and, and how do you promote healthy development? By the mutual responsiveness of adult-child relationships means that the schools, just as you suggest in your document, need to be in the emotional development business, not in the intellectual development business. Why not the intellectual development? Because that follows spontaneously and naturally from healthy emotional development. And so that's where the emphasis needs to be. And teachers need to be ta trained in trauma. They need to be trained in attachment. They need to be trained to deal with their own stuff so they can react to their children, their students, in a way that doesn't threaten the child, that supports the child, that embraces the child. If the schools did that, their intellectual task would be so much easier because kids with emotional security, they want to learn, they're curious, they're sponges for knowledge. There are such terrible stresses that are put on teachers in most public schools these days as well. They have so many children in the class, and also there are strict laws these days. A child might need a hug, but now the you know, the teacher isn't allowed yeah. to hug the child, et cetera. So sometimes even yeah. when teachers see things that they feel they could do differently between the things I just mentioned, standardized, you add to that the pressure of standardized testing, et cetera, we're clearly going backwards. We're, cl we're clearly going in a, in a wrong direction. Given the... Yes. Sorry to interrupt, if I just make a comment, that, of course, from a certain point of view, we're not going in the wrong direction. Because if the intention of the school system is to create not curious, not critical minded, not independent thinking, but uh, cooperative, malleable, controllable employees who's, who are emotionally hurting and therefore will buy all the products that are being sold to them to soothe their emotional pains, then, then we're doing brilliantly. So from the point of view of the system, there's something that works here. It just doesn't work from the point of view of human beings. That's exactly right. And we're living at a time when clearly there is more and more of a divergence between literally a sustainable future for the human race and an unsustainable future for the human race. And what you're describing will give a certain kind of unfettered capitalism a little more time to do its thing, but the human race less time uh, to figure out how to survive and thrive on this planet. What's worrying to me, particularly now with COVID, is that the economic stre uh, uh, stresses uh, and desperation is growing so much among so many people. These children are home alone uh, with, their ch with their parents in more and more cases. And we don't even know the kind of of, of problems that will be growing out of all this in the years to come. Does this concern you? I can't imagine that it doesn't. Well, they, we're already seeing signs of difficulties, kids having more problems, more ticks, more difficulties, parents getting, some parents getting more abusive, more impatient with their kids. So that's on the one side. On the other side, um, there's been in this culture way too much pushing of kids into the peer group and making them rely on the peer group rather than on nurturing adults. Now that's completely unnatural. You know, in an animal group, when you remove the parents, when you remove the, the, the adults, the children become bullies. I'm talking about elephants. And so in our society, there's been way too much of that. So because adults have been missing from kids' lives and kids spend most of the time with each other, now they become each other's mentors and, and influences and, and guides, which is developmentally is a disaster. Now, some parents are finding that, oh my God, I get to know my kids all over again. I get to spend time with them. 
I get to uh, build a relationship with them. I get to see them learn. I get to see their milestones on a daily basis. And so some parents are embracing that. So what I'm saying is there's going to be a divergent effect. Those families that are, those families that are emotionally or economically resourced, they will find a lot of blessings in having to spend time with their kids. And I've heard some parents then, saying this as well. I know when people yeah. say, because I've been very concerned about reopening the schools before it's truly safe. And when I hear people yeah. say, oh, Marianne, you're, you're underestimating the, the mental health need of these kids to go back to school. And I've often felt what you just said and have said, what about the mental health need of these kids to be bonding with their parents more, which should be considered just yeah. as important. Connect this. And those, and, those, and those families where the parents are not resourced emotionally, or economically, of course, it's a totally different picture. Yes. So I think we're going to see a lot of negative effects, and some people will find the benefit. So I think, you know, it's going to go both ways is what I'm saying. Connect all this for me to addiction and the propensity of addic uh, for addiction and where addiction fits into all this. Well, it's interesting. We... We use the word attachment in two different ways. There's the sense in which we're too attached to things. We want things too much. We compulsively crave them. Then there's attachment in the psychological sense, which is the nurturing connection between parent and child. Here's the deal. When our fundamental developmental attachment needs are met, we don't need to develop cravings and attachments of the other kind. Because all addictions, and we, you know, every, there's, there's such nonsense spoken about addiction out there in the medical world and in the legal world. Addiction is seen in the legal world as some kind of a choice somebody makes. Well, believe me, I worked with hardcore addicted people. Nobody ever chose to be an addict. I've had my own addictive issues. I've never chose to be. I didn't choose it. Then there's the idea that it's a disease that you inherit, which is equally nonsense. I'm not going to go into the genetics of it, but there's just zero evidence for that. Zero real evidence for it. What addictions are really all about, and if you ask anybody who's got an addiction, well, I mean, I don't know if you're open to this experiment, but let me give you a definition of addiction and see how you respond. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So an addiction is manifested in any behavior that a person finds pleasure or relief in in the short term and therefore craves suffers negative consequences, and doesn't give it up despite negative consequences. So pleasure, relief, craving, long-term negative consequence, inability to give it up. I said any behavior. I didn't say drugs. Could be heroin, cocaine, like with my patients, crystal meth. Could be caffeine, nicotine. Could be sex, gambling, pornography, power, profit, work, eating, bulimia, self-harming. One could go on and on and on. So let me ask you this. And again, I'm not asking for any details of what, when, and how, but according to that pattern, have you ever had anything that might fall into that pattern in your oh, life? Oh, absolutely. And when I read that exact description in your book, I underlined it with a yellow pen and put three stars next to it. So I absolutely, that it was fun up to a point. It's passionate up to a point. Something you really love up to a well, point. Then at what moment does it become craving without which there are negative consequences due to your behavior? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think I know very few people who wouldn't recognize themselves in that description to some extent. Very good. Then let me ask you the next question. Uh, thanks for being my volunteer. Um, not what was wrong with it or what it was, but what did it do for you? What did you like about it temporarily? What did it give you? Um, affirmation, love. Okay, thank you. That's very similar to what a lot of people tell me. Now, are affirmation and love good things or bad things? Great things. Okay, in other words, the addiction wasn't your problem. Your addiction was your lack of self-value, mm -hmm. lack of self-affirmation, and a lack of love in your life, in your heart. You know, and so that the addiction is not a disease and it's not a choice. It's an attempt to solve a problem. And when you ask, what did the problem come from? It came because your attachment needs as a child were not met. That's all. Had your attachment needs as a child been met, I'm not saying your parents weren't good people. I'm not saying they didn't love you. I'm not saying they didn't do their best. But in some ways, your attachment needs were not met. 
you did not develop a sense of self-affirmation that was healthy enough, nor a sense of love enough. And so that's why the addiction. So addiction is very much a response to the stresses that this society imposes on so many families. And that's why it's so common. Now, if I look, for instance, at, um, you know, you look back at your parents' generation, the different kinds of things. If I, in, in my case, would definitely, that person would definitely be my father. But then I look at his parents. I think it wasn't just what yeah. society imposed on him, but his own, uh, what would have been attachment issues with his own parents for various reasons, et cetera. Do you see a lot of difference in your work? I know you're a physician. Um but in this work and having to do with attachment, children and parents, do you see much difference really, or do you think it's very significant? What's with the mother, you know, the mother, if it's a boy child, the father, if it's a girl child, all of that issue about gender and which parent, do you think that that's particularly relevant to getting out, out of the problem? And also my question to you is, if you know that, yeah. and basically to be honest, I knew that, what what is the then what of that if you didn't get that kind of a time i know i had a boyfriend used to say to me he said every time we say goodbye you seem to think some great tragedy is going to happen why can't it just be bye see you later but yeah. the, but the level of of panic he said that you go into every time i'm going to work that's all that's happening here what do you so you can see that and i can see i didn't get it from my father etc what What's it, what's what's the solution there, doctor? So I thank you, doctor. Doctor's going to answer it. Um, <laughs> the, the, there's really two questions that I understand folded into one here. One is, if I understand it right, um, one is the relative influence of mother and father. Is that is that the case? Yeah, I'm curious about, about that. Okay, well, let me answer that one first, and then what to do next? Okay. okay. So look. It's not a question of blaming any gender here, but how did how did nature set it up? Mother. How did nature? Sorry. Mother. Yes, that's how nature set it up. Mm -hmm. And so the task of uh, of the family, the extended family in the society, is to support the mother in the nurturing role. That doesn't mean leave her stuck or isolated in the nurturing role, but actually to come in as supportive nurturers. And so there's a wonderful psychologist at um, Notre Dame University, Darcy Narvez, who's t uh, studied Aboriginal societies, and she talks about allo mothering when other mothers come in. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a beautiful, uh, beautiful, terrible news item last year. There was an explosion in some Afghan hospital, including mothers were killed in the maternity ward. And mothers would come in, total strangers would show up to breastfeed the babies. That's what's allo, that's what's allo mothering is. These women in, instinctively and, in, and, and intuitively and from their heart, they just wanted to come in and breastfeed those babies. So mothers need a lot of support uh, under the best of times. As the child gets now, where the father comes in, let me tell you something else. This is, um, it gets so complex, but it, to me, it's so fascinating. There was a study in Sweden. We know that stress on the mother, a mother's depression actually increases the risk of prematurity, premature birth. Mm. So this study showed that. But the father's depression prenatally predicted the child's premature birth even more than the mother's. And you think, well, why is that the case? You know why that's the case? Why? It's the same it's the same reason that women get autoimmune disease much more than the men do, because the women absorb the stresses yeah. of the men. So he's depressed, she's absorbing his depression. She's taking it on. And this happens to women all the time. And that's why women are given tranquilizers and antidepressants a lot more than men are, because they're carrying the stresses, and that's why they get autoimmune disease a lot more. They carry the stresses of the whole society, and particularly their men. So the job of the man huh, is to take care of himself and to take care of the mother. And as the child gets older, the father comes in more and more in a nurturing role. And so that we know from one study that was done that they looked at the genetic functioning of teenagers and they looked at 150 different genes. 
and 120 had been affected by stress on the mother in the first years, and 30 were affected by stress on the father in the preschool years. So the more the father comes into it, the more his presence and how he shows up makes a difference. So to, to make a long story short, um, it is the mother, according to nature, breastfeeding and everything else. And but then the father's role is to be there as a solid ground of support and then to come in as a nurturer himself. And so much of that doesn't happen in our culture. I think that young parents, people who are prospective parents, so many people can hear this and gain great wisdom about uh, changes that can be made in the way we raise our children, particularly our babies. But what about someone who is already at the point, which gets to the second question, they're already nodding their head, they're listening to you, they're saying, yep, that was me. And they're dealing with either addictive uh, tendencies or other expressions of their own trauma and their own suffering. What do they do now? And I want to uh, move. One of the things that you've talked about is the failure of modern psychotherapy to answer deeply enough the issues of suffering and tra and trauma. So I'm I'm very curious uh, what your answers are. And also the fact that you have become someone, you yourself practice yoga. You've talked about how important yoga is in your life. And you've also talked about the role of psychedelics. You've talked about ayahuasca uh, as part of somebody's spiritual journey. So as we move into the area of how we address the deeper, deeper layers of the trauma to change things, I'd love to hear what we do once, you know, for the person who says, yep, that was me, then what? Well, so... Um Let's go back to understand what trauma is. So trauma is not what happened to you. Trauma is the wound that you sustained. Now the good thing is, that's a good thing, because if trauma was what happened to me when I was a year old, I'm 77, I'm 76 years too late, aren't I? But if trauma is a wound that I sustained, wounds can be healed at any time. And so the, the, the and, and if you look at the essence of trauma as, my friend, the traumatologist, psychologist Peter Levine defines it, it's a disconnection from the self. And so when you didn't experience affirmation and love, you were just disconnected from yourself. That's all. And, and that's why you turn to the addictive substitute. So that self-affirmation, that love, that can be regained, not regained, but it can be reconnected with because it was never lost. It was just covered up by this wound and this scar. So airy fairy is it my sound the work is really to reconnect with one's true self uh and and and, and to heal the wound and that can be done for anybody who opens themselves to it it can't be done for people who don't realize they're wounded a lot of the people who don't realize they're wounded become presidents of the united states i was going to say the most you dangerous know? people of all some of the most yeah. successful people in our society, uh, as society uh, defines success, are people who, within communities such as yours and mine, look at and go, they're the biggest sociopaths out there. And that's the, the most psychotic behavior. That is not the most healed and hold. And looking to those people to solve things is a scarier and scarier prospect. Man, uh, these it, people are terribly... These people are terribly hungry. Yeah, they they call, they're they called high achievers, <laughs> and some people would call them the yeah. great destroyers. So, so, you know, Freud himself called neurosis separation from self. And I think yeah. the reason why so many people look to religious and spiritual answers, the word religio comes from a Latin root to bind back, and yoga mm. itself, yoke, to, to, to find yeah. back that yeah. yoke. And one of the yeah. things that I've read that you've said or heard you say in one of your talks is, and I think you even mentioned it here in terms of mothers, that when we are disconnected from ourselves, we're disconnected from our own gut responses. We're yeah. disconnected from our own sense of radar, which only makes us spiral down even more and more because we're always looking outside ourselves for answers, correct? That's right. That's right. And, and, and the nature of this society is to give us so many distractions from ourselves. And so many people are so uncomfortable to spend even a moment with themselves. Mm -hmm. And I know that for myself, you know, the, 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 the urge to check the cell phone every minute, or if I have a free minute to Google something, or, you know, I mean, this, this society is built on 
filling people's emptiness from the outside, which can never be done. And that's why it's also addictive. And, and because so many of us grow up with that emptiness and then we need to fill it with our activities and our acquisitions and our relationships and our, our beliefs and our ideologies and rather than saying, okay, there's emptiness here. What does that feel like? And, uh, what, what's, what is that all about? So, so healing to go back to your prime question here does require the willingness to really experience oneself with the way one really is. And, and in the body, and in the mind, and in the heart. And, and there's many ways that you're guided to do that. I mean, there's different modalities. There's my own called Compassionate Inquiry. I'm not putting that ahead of anybody else. That just happens to be what I do. But then there's Peter Levine's Somatic Experiencing, Pac Ogden's Sensory, neuro, sensory Neuromotor Reprogram, I think it's called. There's the EMD, EMDR. Mm-hmm. There is... There is uh, emotionally focused therapy of Sue Johnson. There is uh, Dick Schwartz and his internal family systems. I mean, there's X number of modalities out there. But the essence of them all is to reconnect with oneself. And of course... And that can be done. Spirituality, meditation, prayer, forgiveness, genuine religious experience. I think that this is why there is such a profound yearning for spiritual truth in the world today. There is such a sense that one world is literally falling apart. We are a traumatized society. I think we're a traumatized species at this point. And I think the good news is how many people see this. And I think that there's this simultaneous phenomenon occurring where people are trying to reach for answers. And that's why I thought, that going back to the conversation I was asking about ayahuasca, I think it's very interesting mm. that the conversation around uh, psychedelics is back and uh, I'd, I'd like to hear uh, more of your thoughts about that. Sure. So I was talking to, in, in preparation for the, the book I'm writing now, which I'd be so delighted to come back and talk to you about it when it comes out next year. The title is The Myth of Normal, Illness and Health and an Insane Culture. <laughs> but in, 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 writing, in writing that book, I was talking to Michael Pollan, who wrote um, How to Change Your Mind, mm-hmm. which is about psychedelics. There are the research mm-hmm. on psychedelics. Mm-hmm. And uh, we agreed that as this society is in more in crisis, and then particularly as the treatment modalities more and more prove themselves to be inadequate or even harmful, like a lot of psychiatric approaches are worse than useless. Now, I'm not talking about every psychiatrist, I'm talking in general, and I could go into the reasons why, but let me just state the fact that modern psychiatry, which I'm very well familiar with, is in significant ways a disaster. And and so as people realize that and as the crisis is deepening, people are looking for alternatives. And so Michael said that even in the psychiatric world, he expected a lot of uh, opposition and resistance and resentment. No, people are saying, tell us more. Oh, yeah. Because we know what we're doing. Yeah, which I was really glad to hear him say that. So so I myself, as a, it's a, 12 years ago now, virtually serendipitously, it always is sent of it is found out about ayahuasca, this particular Amazonian plant, and and other plant medicines. Mm-hmm. So I've been working with them now for about twelve years, and for all kinds of reasons, and it depends how deeply you want me to go into it. But they have a potential to open up vistas and self awareness. And I'm talking from direct personal experience, such as to a mind like my own would hardly have been available otherwise, because I have a very strong mind, and that has helped me in many ways in the world. But it also is a protection against pain. One of the, th- a lot of the please go on. I'm sorry. And so, you know, it's okay. So I'm saying that the psychedelics. I'm telling you from direct experience. They kind of get that mental defense out of the way, and you get to see, oh, there's so much pain here, but there's so much love here too, and the pain and the love, they don't invalidate each other. In fact, they can both be there. And, and you don't have to deny the one or crave the other. They're just there. And you can be with them. And so that's, in a nutshell, the helpful psychedelic experience. Now, I'm not a psychedelic evangelist for all kinds of reasons. I think it's not for everybody else. I think it's not practical to even think it being available to everybody given the expense and all that. But as a modality, 
as a potential way in to the psyche. Uh, Western medicine is nuts not to embrace it and to research it and to learn about it because I've seen miracles you wouldn't believe medically and, and psychologically. Well, it's fascinating for someone my age because everything new comes back around again. And it wasn't an accident mm. that in those years we talked about peace and love all the time. It was also wasn't yeah. an accident that we also st- took a stand against a war, wasn't an accident, the civil rights movement, etc. that there was such an embrace of social justice at that time. Uh, people look at it from a very narrow perspective of hippiedom or whatever, but something much deeper was going on there, and a lot of it had to do with the prevalence of psychedelics. Absolutely. You know, in... Well, not only that, from the system, maybe you know this, but from the system's point of view, from the, the Nixonian presidential point of view, attacking psychedelics was exactly an, a, a, a direct assault on people's social consciousness. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. The war of drugs is police state stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's part of much as you were, much like you were talking about the entire educational system. It's about training masses mm-hmm. of people to not be ecstatic, to not be critical thinkers, to not be more expand. It's an anti ecstasy, not just as in the drug, but as in the experience. Even when they come up with drugs for mental health, they leave out the fun part. It's, uh, it's quite extraordinary. And I think more and more people are realizing that's the world was created. We now have the world created by that mentality. How are we doing? And that's why the good thing now is people are looking beyond the obvious answers. There's something I need to say. Okay. I was, I was present in those 60s days as well. And I don't want to romanticize it because there was a lot of irresponsible use of the psychedelics in those days. There was, and which did create problems. So I have to say that just so that this conversation is not misunderstood by anybody, that the use of psychedelics for healing or spiritual realization needs to be done in the right context under proper guidance, not just randomly by people uh, in, a, in a kind of a anarchistic fashion, because that can create problems too. So that just needs to be emphasized. Absolutely. Uh, I interviewed Rick Doblin the other day, and he was talking about this. Of course, I mean, that to me goes without saying, but you... Well, it doesn't go without saying, so I'm glad you said it. And I, and I said it repeatedly um, when, uh, when I was speaking to Rick Doblin as well. So I wholeheartedly agree with you. Um, one of the saddest parts of, of the film, uh, The Wisdom of Trauma, had to do with the incarcerated men who were coming to discover through the Compassionate Prison Project, who were coming to discover how many adverse childhood experiences they had had uh, in their own lives and that they saw the, the, the direct connection that they saw between the trauma of their childhood and the uh, criminal journeys that they ultimately uh, embarked upon. Yes, and if you look at who's in jail, who's in jail is the most traumatized people in society. For some strange reason, in both your country and mine, they happen to be significantly of minority origin. In Canada, Native people, Aboriginal people, make up 4% of the Canadian population. They make up 30% of the jail population. But doesn't that have a and huge financial component in all the ways that we were talking about earlier, about, about the trauma of poverty? The trauma, trauma of poverty and the, and the trauma of racism and the trauma of colonialism and the ongoing oppression. It has to do with all those traumas. And it has to do with, in Canada at least, but you saw the same thing in the States, is the deliberate destruction of those families and the separation of children from their parents. And so then, and the traumatization of children who then go on and traumatize their own children. You know, and and so then liberal theorists bleat about the breakdown of the black family and how it's the failure of the black family to stay together. But they don't look at why the black family has been under such tremendous, tremendous, tremendous. It's amazing how people have survived. It's amazing how they've maintained a sense of family and connection. Same in Canada. They, they, they abducted children for 100 years from their families. They tortured them in residential schools. They sexually abused them. Then they become alcoholics. They abuse their own kids. And then they end up in jail. And we say, what's wrong with those people? 
So these people in jail, as you saw in that segment, and by the way, that's a beautiful segment because the woman who's working with them, it's liberating for people. I've been in San Quentin and, 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 and um, you know, talked with people there and it's so liberating for them to realize that there's nothing evil about them. There's nothing wrong with them. It's something happened to them and it's the way they adapted to what happened. That's actually a liberation for people. So it's poignant, but it's also liberating. I've talked, I, I talked to a man in San Quentin who killed somebody, was involved in killing when he was 19. He's in his 50s now. And I said, well, if you could talk to the parole board, what would you say to them? He said, I'd say to them, I didn't know myself then. I didn't know who I was and where I was coming from. I just had all this rage in me that I was acting out, and I didn't know why. But now I understand why, and I'm a different person now. And if you let me out of here, I'll spend the rest of my life working to help heal other people so they don't have to go through what I went through. And this man said, I didn't know myself. So that segment in the prison, it's poignant and it's sad, yes. It's sad that this is the way the system treats them, but it's also very beautiful. Because those men are stepping forward and they're saying, yes, that happened to me, and now I understand. Not excusing, but understanding where I was coming from. So let me ask you this. Because of your work and the work of others like you, I do believe that there is an opening to a more expanded recognition of what's going on. I love what you said earlier, that the pain and the love exist simultaneously. I think there's a lot of pain in looking at what's really happening in our societies. And also there's a lot of love that comes from it. I know in my own life, you know, you spend so much time uh, or at least so much effort and energy trying to keep at bay the realization of your own character defects. And I remember a time in my life when I was looking at something that I simply could no longer avoid looking at it because um, one person would say it and you go, oh, that's not true about me. Another person would say, oh, that's not, and I'd say, oh, that's not true about me. And then you realize three or four people are saying it and they're in different parts of the country and they don't know each other. So maybe there's something you need to look at. And I remember an experience I had when I, I looked at myself and I, I faced something I had not wanted to face. And I realized I hadn't wanted to face it because I thought I would feel such self-hatred if it was true. And I felt yes. the exact opposite. I felt a compassion for myself that I had not experienced before because I realized, wow, how hurt I must have been in life to have developed yeah. that as a defense mechanism. And yes. it really gave me a lot of compassion for myself. And I think it takes a lot of compassion for Western civilization. It takes a lot of compassion for our societies and compassion for our unborn great-grandchildren to be willing to look at our societies up honestly enough to recognize the not only the levels of trauma, but the levels of self-inflicted trauma that is, is, is all around us and sometimes inside of us more than we knew. Because of people like yourself, we're beginning to understand it more. My question to you is, do you have hope in this period that is clearly a race for time that we will make enough changes in ourselves and in our institutions, our, our educational institutions, our medical institutions, our economic institutions, our political institutions, et cetera, to be able to turn things around fundamentally enough to keep our civilization from completely imploding? Well, Marianne, I don't know what I would have said to that question a week ago, but I'll tell you what I say, it, say to it today, okay? Which is that I'm not interested in hope. I don't know what's gonna happen. What I do know is that I'm here now and you're here now. And the question is, what possibility is present at this very second for you and I and everybody else who's listening, whoever they are, she, he, they, whoever they are, what possibility exists in the present moment for them, for all of us, to bend the future in a humane and loving direction? How it'll turn out, who the heck knows? I don't have a crystal ball. 
what I do know that what I'm called upon to do, and that's in the present moment. And it'll be what it'll be. But even if I knew for sure that it's going to go down the tube, and I don't know, I don't know that, and something in me doesn't believe it, but I would still say, at the present moment, this is what I'm compelled to do, and this is what this is the choice that we all ha- all have all have is to decide how do we want to relate not to some imagined future, but to the present. So that would be my answer, which kind of doesn't it sidesteps the issue of hope, but I don't need hope. I just need the present possibility that is here right now, this very second. And and I'm I read your stuff, and I was inspired by your presidential campaign. Thank you. I'm inspired by. I'm inspired by other people out there who are doing, I mean, I don't, if somebody had asked you, by the way, let me ask you this question, if, if, if you permit me. Um, when you decide to make that run, do you ever hope that you become president of the United States? My answer was exactly the way you answered me, that it didn't matter. Okay. What matters is some things must be said. And I think you gave not only a beautiful answer to my question, but the right answer, because we create the future and the present. And I, and I, I feel it's, it, it's very parallel. If we have the conversation now, something good will come of it. Whether it's you, whether it's me, whether it's while we're still on the earth or not, it's almost irrelevant. If we dig deep enough and act true enough and speak truly enough and, and are honest enough and strip away the falsehood in this moment, then like you said, it doesn't matter what happens in the future and it's the only hope we have for the future. Exactly. And future aside, it'll help liberate present people in the present moment. And there is no time. (laughs) And linear time itself is part of the illusion that's the prison that we're all locked in. Um, As Einstein said, time and space are illusions of consciousness, albeit persistent ones. Yes, and I I had a deep experience of that recently. And so I'm speaking differently on the other side of that experience than I would have spoken before the experience, you know? Do you feel like sharing any of that? Well, um, yeah, I can tell you a little bit about it. Um, so based on that childhood infant travail that I had to move through in my first year, year and a half of life, uh, I'd always been convinced that some light had been killed inside me that will never open up, the light of unity, the light of love, the light of presence, you know? I could talk about it, I could teach about it, I could help others, but I would never get there myself. You know? And it turns out that's not true. <laughs> and and not only that, I had this loyalty. A, a, a friend of mine, I was talking to a friend of mine the other, last night actually, and he said, I've always had this royalty. He's talking about me, you Gabor, I've always had this royalty to your grandparents who were killed in Auschwitz and to all the suffering in the world. And you've always made yourself believe that if for you to be happy or to experience joy is to betray all that suffering. And and I was talking to somebody else from Slovenia Sunday morning, and she said to me, you can't give the Germans that victory. You can't give the Nazis that victory, that they killed the light in you. You can't give that to them. And so what I've learned is precisely what I articulated earlier, which is that there could be that horror, and it is in the world that horror. And this society perpetrates horror around the world, as we both know, uh, at home and abroad. There's all that. And there's the beauty, and there's the love, and the one doesn't negate the other. As a matter of fact, all that, and I'm certainly not the first one to say it, I just wouldn't have understood it before. All that horror that is being perpetrated comes from people who are cut off from love. 
Now, there's systemic reasons for it, there's economic reasons for it, political reasons. I'm not trying to put it all in the realm of spirituality or psychology, but it does work on that level. Anyway, so what I've understood is that neither I or any other human being is excluded from that unity and, 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 and from, the, from that love, although we may believe we are, and we may have really good reasons for believing that we are. And I don't blame anybody for whatever they believe. And something you said as well is that, um, well, there's a psychotherapist. Her name is um, Edith Egger. You probably know about her. No, I don't. She, but Edith Egger is a Jewish Hungarian woman who was sent to Auschwitz, probably on the same shipment that my grandparents from a town in Czechoslovakia called Kosice. And she survived. Her parents did not. My, my grandparents did not. But they must have been on the same shipment or within a couple of days of each other. So she's 92, now 93. She's writing books. She's written two books. Called, one's called The Choice. The other's called The Gift. And she says in The Gift, I think it's in The Gift, maybe in The Choice she says it. And I talked to her. I talked to her not long ago. And, um, and she said, we all have a Hitler inside of us. And you know what? The thing is to love the Hitler inside of us. Because you said earlier, can you imagine the pain that gave, you were talking about yourself, but being compassionate with parts of yourself, but can you imagine the pain that must have been incurred to create that kind of hardness and that kind of hatred and that kind of um, desperation that creates the Hitler inside all of us? You know, so compassion for everything. Compassion for everything. Which doesn't mean that you don't oppose things. It doesn't mean you stand up. You, you, you don't stand up against the Hitlers in the world. It doesn't mean you give in. It doesn't mean you succumb or that you, or that you subject yourself. But you can do whatever you do in resistance with compassion. In other words, love really is the answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is there any particular piece of advice that anyone has given you that has meant more to you than any other? Two. Um, one is, I used to have a patient who was a leading Canadian poet. His name was Warren Tallman, and he, he was a friend of Allen Ginsberg, and he was a very well-known uh, poet, and he was a professor at the University of British Columbia. And after I opened my medical practice, he became a patient of mine. And I said to him once, uh, you know, uh, uh, Warren, I, I want to write, but I don't know what. And he said, you will write when you'll have learned something that you want to preach to the world, he said. And that's how it went. Well, Number one. Number two, the, the other thing I was going to say was, I'm sure the name Bessel van der Kolk, you, you, you know who he is. He's a, a trauma psychologist. Yes. His book on trauma is actually on the New York Times bestsellers list this week and has been for a while it's called the body keeps the score right of course of course and and Bessel and i were having lunch once and he said to me you know gabor you don't have to drag our shoots around with you everywhere you go and what i understand now that that meant is i don't have to hold on to the suffering i don't have to hold on to the resentment i can just be with the pain and allow the love and I don't have to drag that into my worldview that that should, be, I don't have to allow that to define how the world is for me. And that's the problem with trauma is that it, we have a certain experience and when then we, that defines the world for us. And so I don't have to allow that to happen. A woman who was a tremendous influence on my life spent uh, three years from 21 to 24 at Auschwitz. She ended up being profoundly successful in every possible way. Um, and a story she used to tell is that when she walked out of Auschwitz, she looked behind her and said to herself, Adolf Hitler got three years of my life. He will not get another day. Wow. Wow. And Edith Eggert talks about she goes to Germany and forgives Hitler. Not for his sake, but her own. 
She doesn't want to be in prison. Like, there's a story about two Buddhist monks who were approaching the river, and a woman comes up to them and says, "I do you know that story? The the woman who comes. Well, you, you do. I, I do know the story. You can certainly tell the audience about how one of them carries the woman across, yeah. and the other one. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but the, the other one says, you know, and the other one says, how can you touch that woman? How could you have done that? We're we're monks. We're not supposed to be touching women. And and the other one says, I put the woman down five miles ago. You're still carrying her. That's the story, right? So that's absolutely the story. So what I'm getting from you is that we must look at our trauma. We must understand it. We must feel compassion for ourselves and others. We must try to make the changes that we can make in our society to diminish the incidence of trauma, and we can heal and let it go. That's what I'm getting. Is that what we're supposed to get here? Well, first of all, I endorse every statement you just made with one exception. There's no must. It's available for us, should we choose it. And as to what you're supposed to get, there's no supposed to. People will get precisely what they will get. Thank you, Gabor Mate. As much as I have gained from reading your books and as much as I gained from watching the documentary, I even gained more from the profound mm. and eloquent, beautiful things you said here today. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful. Well, my greatest pleasure, and it's been a real privilege and pleasure to work with you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, if that interview with Gabor Mate did not take you deep, I don't know what will. I uh, thought that was really amazing. I'm kind of shaken by some of it myself, and I'm sure you are too. I love how he said that the love and the pain exists simultaneously. And I think that's true not only in terms of our own personal lives, but in terms of our world today. It takes a lot of love to look honestly at ourselves. It takes a lot of love and compassion for ourselves to look honestly at the world. Uh, we see a lot of pain there. But on the other side of that, there's so much repair. There's so much redemption. There's so much healing. And um, there's so much love. So how lucky are we that he's on the planet? How fortunate are we that so many people are laying claim to a new conversation, new ways of being, new possibilities that will help us turn the corner. I want to thank all of you who send me really great questions, and I'm sorry we can't do all of them. The one I'm going to do today is from someone named Jocelyn. Hi, Marianne. I was listening with rapt attention to your conversation with Bruce Lipton, and at one point you explained with deep power the truth of our deep spiritual malignancy of addiction to the delusion of an independent self, comparing the sickness of the body's cellular cancer to the cultural-slash-human equivalency of the distortion delusion of a separate self. And you said something like, the malignancy will be killed too when it lives this way. I was deeply moved, and I felt here the interplay of despair with my own relationships to this malignant current in myself. I fall into entrapment with the soul sickness of ego as a lone slash apart and suffer it mightily. I'm deeply addicted to fear. And a, and a part of me feels complicit in the demise and death of this whole human movement slash venture into evolution. I despair. When I heard you name the death this way of life, as I felt that twinge of despair and darkness and that lie, I should just let all this die. What other way is there? And I wondered if you could speak directly to mine and others' hearts who feel entwined, defeated, resigned even to the sickness of delusion of the separate self. What is the relationship of death to the divided ego? My instinct tells me that source resolves this in Christ. How do we heal when we remain stuck in addictive patterns of aversion to intimacy with the truth? I'm a mental health counselor serving right now and with some suicidal clients, and I find myself struggle with seduction with despair. I understand spiritual truths, but resist being compelled into a revolution of the self where ego would root into source profoundly. I've read the course twice, but never completely, and with your help, I've started this year to follow along, dreaming of a tomorrow where I will be more deeply healed of mind, heart, and spirit. 
Thank you for your work. P.S. I love Jerry Jampolsky. I'm a Jewish mother, past comedian, artist, and practicing Lutheran, always feeling ambivalent about my relationship to Christ, but deeply apprehended by love manifest. And I felt source in you reaching out to me, especially when I needed it today. Thank you. Eternally, your sister in love. Another wave, Jocelyn. Well, Jocelyn, I am really glad that you're doing the 365 days of workbook lessons along with me. And for those of you who are interested, you can find out more about that at Marianne.com. It's the 365 days from the work, uh, lessons from the workbook of A Course in Miracles. You know, Jocelyn, as uh, Gabor Mate was talking about today, there are many different modalities. There are many different ways, both religious, spiritual, and secular, by which people are making that reconnection today, that reconnection to the essential self. You know, so much of, of the last human, of human history in the last 200 years has torn us away from a deeper intimate experience with source, with God, with intimate self. And the irreverence is then projected onto how we treat the earth, how we treat each other, uh, as well as how we treat ourselves. We have lost a sense of who we are, as Gabor says, because we've lost a, a, a sense of where we come from. And from a religious and spiritual perspective, as you well know, we are ideas in the mind of God. And when we forget who, that we are one with the divine source, then we forget who we are. And forgetting who we are, we forget who other people are, and we forget our place in the universe. And this is the sickness of soul, the separation from self that we know is the existential angst of our times. We talked about it with uh, Gabor Mate today. You said, uh, Jocelyn, that you have read the Course several times, but you've never completed that workbook. And the Course in Miracles says that the workbook is the crux of the Course because the crux train, the, the workbook trains the mind to think along the lines that the text sets forth. The Course in Miracles says that enlightenment begins as abstract concepts. So many of us know the abstract concepts now. We get the abstract concepts. I always say the era of data collection is over. We get it. We've all read the same books now. We've all listened to the same tapes. But it's through meditation, through prayer, through actually doing that deeper work, a lot of which is what uh, Gabor was talking about today, really getting down into the level of the vertical. That's where... That's where the healing happens. The Course in Miracles, he says, I cannot take from you what you will not release to me. Spiritual and personal healing is a kind of detox, just like physical detox is. All that stuff has to come up in order to be released. A Course in Miracles is only one uh, way to get there. It doesn't have any kind of monopoly on the truth. There's one truth, and it's spoken many, many different ways. And as he was saying, there's so many modalities. Uh, All the great religious systems have that spiritual, mystical core. There are so many ways, and many of those ways are secular, too. It It doesn't matter what the language is. And, you know, I'm not an enlightened master. I don't think I know anyone who is, although I think maybe one person I know is. But the point is, I, what I see in my own life and what I see in the lives of many people I know, I'm not, you know, this person who's totally aligned with my best self 24-7. But I can honestly say that I'm there more often than I'm not, that I have the peace and the happiness of, of knowing that it's more the rule than the exception. And I think that's where, that, that's a journey so many of us are on now. And we need to be able to make this change in ourselves because we can't give what we don't have. We, we cannot really give to the world what we are not at least trying to embody. And so many people, Jocelyn, are realizing now that the work on the world is not separate from this work on ourselves. When you say that you are constantly tempted, you are constantly lured into the delusion of the separate self, we all are. Every time we judge someone, every time we, we you know, blame instead of bless, every time we take a grievance, have a grievance instead of accepting the miracle, every time we show up in any situation to get rather than to give, any time we're so self-referenced that we're leaving other people's experience out, we all go there. This is the state of, of the world because the world is dominated by the thought system of the ego. 
and this breeds fear, all the traumas that uh, Gabor was talking about and that you described in your letter. But then there's the healing journey. And most of the people who would be listening to this program are on it. And we have incredible genius paths like the course, like books by people like Gabor Mate. There, there is this, this simultaneous, these two phenomena going on right now. One world, the world of fear, the world of ego, the world of separation, the world of irreverence. It's falling apart. It, it, the center cannot hold there. But then there's another world, Jocelyn. And that's where we're all opening up to some new possibilities. And it has to start within ourselves. It starts with those morning meditations. I don't know of any serious spiritual uh, path that does not talk about the importance of meditating in the morning. If you wake up and the first thing you do is you go to the television or the computer and the phone and you download all the fear and chaos of the world, then there's no reason to be surprised when you're depressed by noon. But when we download first something that inspires you, some, some path, some inspirational reading, whether it's The Course in Miracles or any other, that, that don't make any one particular path special. But when you know what your path is to actually walk it, we literally download a different template for our nervous system for the rest of the day. And sometimes we get it right, and sometimes we fall off the spiritual wagon. Sometimes you're loving and forgiving and kind, and sometimes you go into some other place in your personality. Sometimes things are smooth, and sometimes you are confronted with real relationship difficulties, which are the lessons that we have to go through in order to get to where we need to go. And everybody right now, Jocelyn, I think that this is a very tough time for people. Everything's so concentrated. But there's a meaning to all this. There's a purpose to all this. We're becoming the people we need to be in order to do what we need to do in order to repair not only ourselves, but repair this world. So I'm glad that you're doing the daily lessons. This time, stay with it. Because you have all the intellectual abstract information. But listen, if... if if all it took was abstract intellectual in information about spiritual principle to get there, I would be an enlightened master already. I get it. I get it. I've written books about the principles. Knowing the principles intellectually is only the beginning. And then The Course in Miracles says, then we take a journey without distance from the head to the heart. And The Course in Miracles says that every person has a highly individualized curriculum. Every circumstance, every situation, every relationship is a, is, a, is, a, is a lesson. And The Course in Miracles says that every moment we are making a decision, we are making it consciously or we're making it unconsciously, whether we're going to open our hearts or close our hearts. And it's all one moment at a time. I remember when I was a little girl, and you might have had one of these too, Jocelyn. Did you ever have an Adipearl necklace? When I was a little girl, we had Adipearl necklaces. And you had this gold chain. And then on your birthday, you got a pearl. Another, you know, Christmas or Hanukkah, you got a pearl. And some other occasion, you got a pearl, Adipearl. And one day, you would have a whole necklace. You know, how'd you do la this hour? I was okay. And then the next hour, maybe you weren't okay. And you have to learn and try to pick it up and be better the next hour. And also, Jocelyn, I've seen in my own life, the only real failure is something you fail to learn from. You can learn from your failures and say, I didn't get that right, but I want to be better next time. So you're on the path, and the path is not always easy. And sometimes we're down on our hands and knees, and sometimes our elbows and our knees are scraped because it's rough going. But we're on that journey, and it's important that we're on that journey, Jocelyn, not only for ourselves, but for the world. Because if we don't rise up, how are we going to lift back up this fallen world? So stay with it. That's what I hear in my heart about you. You know what to do. Whether it's the Course in Miracles, which it sounds like it is, or any other path, stay with it. And that's what I feel about so many people right now. We're better positioned sometimes than we give ourselves credit for. We just have to step it up. I think that's true. I think most of us, if we really look at our lives, realize, 
I'm not that bad. I just need to step it up. So thank you, Jocelyn. Thank you to all of you. Thank you so much for being with me this week. I hope you were moved as I was by the conversation with Gabor Mate. I hope that you will remember about his film, uh, The Wisdom of Trauma. It's truly excellent. And uh, if you have a question for me, remember, you can write to me at marianne at castmedia.com. If you enjoy the um, the program, I hope that you will rate it. I hope that you will tell your friends about it. Go to YouTube. Uh, go to all the different places that you listen to podcasts. And I want to thank uh, the people who make the program possible. I want to thank Amanda Elliott and Austin Kendrick and Lauren Selsky and Wendy Zoller and all of you. I hope you feel that uh, these are conversations that matter. They matter to me, and I hope they matter to you. All my best. I'll see you next week.